and uh, get started if we could, please. Um, you wanted to, yeah, I would think at the podium. And when you get there, if you'll look and show her, there's a little button you mash and it turns green. Okay. I wanted to tell you, <clears throat> first of all, uh, thank you so much for coming this afternoon. We're kind of on a tight schedule. We got four of you coming in and we got a gavel in at four. So um, I'll be very brief. Good deal. Good deal. Thank you. I wish we had plenty of time. I'd love to sit and hear the whole story. Yes, sir. I will be brief. Let me just find my papers. Absolutely. You can sit right there if you'd like at the end. Okay. Come on, come sit. Come sit with us. As the river rises. Yeah. Yes, Anna gave Anna gave them out. Good afternoon. I'm Susan McKay with Grand Gulf Park. Um, we're actually Grand Gulf Monument Commission. Um, the reason I'm here today is to ask for at least level funding. Um, we've had quite a few issues come up over the past year. Um, termites are one of them that we're having to deal with that's cut into our budget by about $30,000. And the next is the campground. The campground is literally caving in. And so far I've spent over 29,000 and I've had crews down there working right now. Um, the park has been, there are quite a few things that haven't been done in years. And we've gotten to that critical point where we only have a couple of years to build it back up or we're gonna start losing things as we are now. Um, The handout that I gave you is additional things that are needed to keep the park in the condition that it should be in. And I've tried to do it in order of um, how critical things are. And as you can see, the first thing is the termite repairs. I've got a crew coming in in two weeks. We don't have any choice. We're gonna have to do that, which again is cutting into, into our main budget. How many uh, buildings are they treating? Um, four have been treated already. Um, they're going to treat five this time. It, there are, this type of termite is very rare. It's called the dry wood termite. And there's only one person in the state that's certified to do that. And the treatment's going to be about 15,000. And then after that, you're going to look at about 5,000 a year just for renewal, for reinspections and Reason um, that, that's the business I'm in. Oh, okay. That's okay, go ahead. Okay. And then our um, main critical thing is our roof and our museum has been leaking for over a year and we have numerous priceless things in there that cannot be replaced. 
Um, building in grounds was down there Friday. So hopefully within the next two months, they'll start working on it. Is that a metal or a shingle roof? It's a shingle roof. Yeah, I thought I saw. Yes, sir. Um, the next is the upper campground, which we've had to deal with this weekend, as you can imagine, with all the freezing temperatures. Uh, the way it was laid out, we have utilities crossing over utilities, uh, pipes busting. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was out there at 8.30 Friday night trying to help the park ranger fix one. We are going to be at capacity. We already have a waiting list for the next It'll, this outage is going to last about 90 days. So that's 40 pads that are going to be completely full. And that's a main source of revenue. That's what I was just about to ask. I just counted these between the upper and the lower, uh, count 20 each. Yeah, uh, actually, they're 22 on um, the lower level and 20 on the upper. The park ranger lives in one. And then we have one on the upper campground that is literally caving off. So we, we've had to mark it off. So we're not gonna be able to use it this year, but we have a plan to get that fixed. And um, as you can see, it's gonna be about $22,000. And I thought that was the temporary fix, but I talked to the contractor um, I believe it was Thursday afternoon, and that is, um, it should be a, a, a semi-permanent fix. There's no, with the soil that we have, that lowest soil on the bluff, there's no way to permanently fix it, but it will take care of it uh, and for at least a couple of years. And uh, let's see, where am I? Under that, a director's house. This house is original to the site. It was built in 1830, and it happens to be the house that I'm required to live in, and we have three main supports that are rotten underneath it. And the closest estimate I've been able to get has been 80,000, and that, that could be a plus or minus with that. So it's pretty critical that we get that fixed as well. Um, the main workshop, that one of the west walls is caving in. That's where all the guys assemble things. It's it's a huge building and- Which a, building is that? It is the main workshop. And the west wall is starting to separate from the south and the north elevations. And our best estimate for that is 20,000. And the next thing is the Spanish house porch. The Spanish house was built in 1790 before um, Mississippi was even part of the US. And if we don't get this fixed in the next year, it's gonna just totally collapse. And like I say, it is original to the site. Um, the other issues are the roads through the park. They need to be replaced and repaired. We have severe erosion, especially in one part. Um, the estimate for that is 325. I've spoken with the contractor since then, and our, there's one curve that's really, really dangerous. A bank is about to cave in, and then the road is undermined. Just for that portion alone, it's 125,000. The jail roof repair, um, one corner has been damaged. Um, as you can see, this is further down my list. So uh, the road to Fort Coben and the square of Grand Gulf. Um, I don't even know how to describe these roads. Uh, uh, they, the potholes, the erosions, we have tour buses that come through it to try to get out to Fort Morgan, I mean, to Fort Coben. And you have to drive off the road in places because it's safer than driving on the road. And another thing we're gonna be needing is a, um, at some point we're gonna to have to, at some point soon, we're gonna to have to relocate the museum to higher grounds. 
Where the pavilion is now is where the museum should be. Every year we have a scare, we, we start our contingency plan to move everything out of the museum. And it just makes better sense to have the museum at the top of the hill so that we don't ever have to worry about that again and put the pavilion where the museum is. We have priceless things in there, ranging from a letter from George Washington to dinosaur bones. You can't imagine the things we have in there. If you've, if you've never been there, you just kind of have to see it to believe it because it's, we have quite an eclectic mix it is, and it's all invaluable. In addition to that, we have downed trees all throughout the park, which make the park look terrible. I have two and a half guys that do the maintenance. They do a wonderful job, but then the, there's still these trees that were left over from tornadoes, things like that, that we do not have the time or the funds to get those taken care of. And it would make a huge impact on the on the all the aesthetics of the park if that were done. Question. Yes, sir. The Grand Gulf plant itself. Yes, sir. Do you all receive any funding from them? Not one dime. No, sir. They pay taxes to the state, though, right? We need, we need to check. We have asked for assistance, but they have not. I mean, just even to get us to loan us two storage pods when we thought we were gonna to have to move everything out of the museum into those pods. And they wouldn't even help us with that, so. Yeah. Okay. And I know this is asking for a lot, but um, like I said, it's gotten to the critical point if we don't do it now, then we're going to start losing things and we're not going to have the park that we do now. I mean, we have the potential to have a fantastic park. If you read our reviews, they are outstanding. It's a hit, you know, they, most of them describe us as a hidden gem. And on another note, I even had it set up to where the Delta Princess was going to be a, a regular stop at Grand Gulf until one flood, they bring, they would meet the boat with two different tour buses that would bring them through the park. But with the, you know, like I said, with buildings starting to fall down around us, but, you know, in essence, we're not gonna have that. And we, you know, we're unlimited if we could get these things fixed because we do a lot of marketing. Okay. We'll certainly take a look at this and I, and I I know I want to find out what kind of taxes generated from that. See what we can do to CEF funding. Yes, sir. Can I? Uh, the state gets $20 million a year. Uh, $20 million. And that's every year. I know that was a quick run over that. Does anybody have any questions or need any more clarification? A very good handout. And I've had an opportunity to talk with Senator Butler uh, about some of this already. Yes, sir. And the very last page is a map and I've got it highlighted. The roads that are caving in. Um, Senator Butler, um, Anna and Tony came down to visit us back in December and I took them through the whole thing and the evacuation route scared them to death. We have to use that when we flood and in the event of a nuclear emergency and it's about to cave off. So if any, we could get any help at all with the roads, that would be wonderful. We're going to check into this and see what we can do. Um, because that there's certainly funds flowing in from that that plant, we will do everything we can to help you. Yes, sir. Oh, and one more thing, and on our um, summary of positions on the very front sheet, yes. it's got us cutting it, us down to five full-time people and one part-time. I really need the seven and the one, or at least a six and a one, if at all possible. 
because we're operating on the skeleton crew right now and it's, it's getting hard to keep people with that much work. I'm sorry. Right, and I know it's not done very often, but uh, even a, a, a second part-time person would help because when we're out, one, when one, one person is down, everybody has to rearrange and man different stations and things get neglected and that kind of thing. Already, we'll be in touch with you. In, in a, in All right, thank you for your time. MDEQ. Hey, Miss Alice. Good to see you, sir. Oh, doing fine. If you would, please, sir, make sure that that green button is on, please. Sir. Green light. Green light. You got the green light to go. All right. I'm going to jump right on it, right in. I've handed you all uh, a one pager that sort of uh, has the pertinent things. Our total ask or request back in August, which uh, there's a copy of our um, re budget request letter attached to the to the one pager was uh, $14,115,000 and change. Um, that included several major components. Uh, one, we took level funding uh, and then added um, $2.25 to fill 25 vacancies. We have a number of vacancies, like a lot of agencies, but one uh, I wanted to always try to make the point that uh, a vacancy showing up on a, on a report, 90 day report or 180 day report doesn't necessarily mean we don't need that position. Uh, we have been, um, we're, we're very short staffed and I know I'm uh, same song, different verse, but um, we have, uh, I don't mind saying that we feel like we have trimmed the fat at DEQ. There, we are into the meat and to, in some places down to the bone. We have branches that have managers and no staff. Uh, we've held a lot of vacancies open to manage the budget uh, as a budgetary management tool. And so um, I'm not asking to fill all of our vacant pens, but start to fill some of those back. And so 2.25 million of our request um, in, was, was to account for filling of 25 of those, of those current vacancies. And that is, that number was at pre-SEC squared. It was without regard to SEC squared, which I'll come back to in just a minute. Um, $625,000 was included uh, to make uh, IT security and infrastructure upgrades. This was to address uh, specific findings from a security audit, IT security audit that's, that's required by state law and which we conducted. And, we're, we're trying to address those issues that came up in that. And then the third major component of that request was a, a placeholder of half a million dollars to implement SEC squared. Uh, at the time, we of course did not know how SEC squared was gonna shape up. The personnel board has since approved the new uh, classification and compensation program uh, or system. Um, I've given you two numbers to implement SEC squared. I would of course encourage the legislature to come as close to full implementation of SEC squared as possible. And by that, I mean, 
looking at the uh, the midpoint of the new pay scales or the market rate as the as is the term that this serve, uh, personnel board has used. Um, the two numbers that you see on the sheet there uh, to raise to bring all of our to bring to bring all of our employees up to the minimum of the new SEC squared uh, pay scales. Uh, if you use um, if you use salaries as of or if you use level funding as the basis, level funding versus last year as the basis for calculation, which included half a million dollars for implementation of SEC squared, uh, it would, we would need another $594,643 to bring everybody up to the minimum of the new pay scales. To bring all of our employees up to the market rate or the midpoint of the new pay scales would cost uh, we would need an additional four million twenty four thousand six hundred forty three dollars. That's above. Uh, if you if you use salaries as of December thirty first, twenty twenty one, you would just add half a million to each of those numbers. Um, but that would the what I would consider full implementation of SEC squared would be to bring all of the employees up to the market rate. But I understand that that's a uh, that's a large request. Um, American Rescue Plan. Um, there, are, there are bills working their way through um, both houses of the legislature related to ARPA. Um, I anticipate that DEQ will serve some role in the distribution of ARPA funds. I understand that, that uh, exactly what that role is gonna be is, uh, is yet to be to determine, but um, I anticipate that we will need contractual support. We will need to, we will have to dedicate some employees. We'll have to bring some, draw some employees away from other parts of the agency and sort of form an ARPA group with internally. But realistically, we're going to have to have contractual support, not only to manage the funds themselves, and we would need, um, and we're asking for administrative uh, fees to be included uh, in the in the ARPA legislation in order to cover the administration of the program. But in addition to that, we're gonna have a permitting workload. All of these projects that are gonna get funded under ARPA that otherwise might not would have been funded, there's gonna be some sort of, there's gonna be some level of permitting workload that we're going to have to absorb. And just like we don't have staff sitting around waiting for a grant program to come along, and we're glad to do our part, uh, and where we'll make that happen, we also, our permitting staff doesn't have time on their hands right now either. And they're going to have an additional workload specifically related to ARPA. I think the best way to handle that, to manage that, would be through contractors. It's going to be a short-lived program. We've got four years to spend the money. And the most efficient way to get the work done is to use contractual support. We have a list, an IDO uh, uh, procurement that we did where we have uh, consulting firms on retainer, if you will. We have the uh, gone through a competitive process to procure those contracts. We have the contractors in place. We just would need uh, additional funding to uh, to to uh, pay them to do the, to help us with that additional workload. I don't have any way of putting a dollar figure to that at this point. I, I think as the process works its way out, we get a better feel for how many projects there might be and that kind of thing. I think that picture will become clearer, but I just mentioned that as um, something that we're gonna have to deal with. And, and in the interest of time, I'm flying through this stuff. Obviously, I'll be glad to answer questions. Um, but uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on uh, or two, 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 uh, last things at the bottom of the handout that I gave you, and this isn't necessarily an appropriation issue. The, the state revolving fund is a low interest loan fund for uh, where we provide low interest loans to municipalities and utility authorities for white wastewater infrastructure work. Uh, the health department runs the drinking water program. We run the wastewater program. It's been a very popular program. It will continue. There con the demand for it continues, and we anticipate that it will continue, notwithstanding ARPA. And um, 
we have historically requested matching funds. We get five federal dollars for every one dollar in state funds that we uh, matching funds that we put up, and all six of those dollars are loaned out. And, and then all of the payment, the repayments and interest all go back into the revolving fund and the interest on the five federal dollars, in addition to the interest on the one state dollar, all go to pay off that bond debt. Uh, in the past, there have been times when it was appropriate, the matching funds were appropriated instead of um, uh, provided through bonds. And so that's the reason I bring it up in this context. One twist on that this year is that uh, under the federal infrastructure bill, there was some, there is some supplemental money available to the SRF. It's an additional match at a lower rate and about half of the money goes to, uh, is, can be used for what in essence is a grant as opposed to a loan. And so uh, those, those numbers are in that uh, breakdown is in, your, in the table at the bottom of that handout. And the last thing I'll mention before I uh, open it to questions, uh, we have historically been provided lump sum authority and budget flexibility, and we would ask that that continue uh, to help us manage the funds uh, most efficiently. With that. Anyone have any questions? Um, you mentioned that you were, you had a lot of pens available. You were, you were down low on staff. Approximately how many are unfilled? I think we have, I have that number. Ballpark. It's uh, about 150 vacant pens. We, um, at our, at our uh, peak a number of years ago, we were probably a couple of decades ago, we were somewhere around 500 employees. We've been running between 370 and, and 400 for quite some time now. And we, we, it fluctuates a little bit, but uh, we would be, we're, um, you know, for me, if I can get my weight down to 190, that seems to be a happy space place for me. 210, I'm a little bit uncomfortable. It kind of goes that way for us. You know, we're we're kind of comfortable around 390. Um, but um, anyway, some of these field operators going out and actually checking things. The yes, yeah, so, uh, it's 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 a little bit of everything. It's permit writers, it's compliance and uh, enforcement uh, folks, it's field field uh, personnel. It's across the board. We've got vacancies. All some of it's. Uh, I started to say support staff. It's technical support staff. So like our air. Uh, modeling and monitoring staff, uh, air division in particular, has been carrying a high vacancy rate. Well, certainly, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, any other, any, anybody else have any questions? All right. Thank you, so much for coming. thank you all. We'll certainly take a look at this. Yes, sir. Okay, next we have archives and history. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like for you, if you would go to the podium, please. Make sure that green button is on for her, please. Excuse me, Joey. Joey. Two senators right here, if you could, please. Thank you. We got them. Okay. Okay. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to introduce our board president, Spence Flatgard. You may know him, and then our 
Finance Director Joey Roberts is with me. As always, I need to start by thanking you for your strong, strong support over the years for the Department of Archives and History. Uh, not every state historical agency can say that, and I'm grateful to you and, and also gratified to live in a state uh, that cares about its history. So thank you for that. Uh, our request today is pretty straightforward. First, we request that you restore our general funds by $209,242 back to our funding level in 2020 before the COVID cuts. Our other requests are related to the variable compensation plan, and I need to thank you all for your support for that plan, uh, which I think is really, really going to help our staff uh, help us raise our salaries to where they need to be. Uh, we've been working over the last few months very closely with the staff personnel board um, to get them the information they needed and to wade through the information that, that we got about uh, the impact on our agency. And we come with a very uh, limited request um, that comes from our analysis of, of the impact. Uh, we're requesting uh, seven new positions in areas of growth for the department. We look not just at areas of growth, but in three categories. Uh, areas that by adding a position or two, we can save money for the state. The example is the state record center where we're taking on a huge number of additional records from other agencies, UMMC, Department of Health and others uh, that will save them money that they've been spending in renting private storage space. Um, we looked at areas where we can bring in new money. We're requesting funding for a grant writer. The department brought in over a million dollars in private or non-state funds uh, this last year. And I guarantee you that when I come back to you next year, that, that number will be higher. Uh, we think we can do better with a grant writer. The third, third category in which we're requesting uh, just a few new positions is um, supporting economic development in the state. Uh, our historic preservation staff review projects in Mississippi that involve federal funding. The number of projects that they review has skyrocketed because of the relief money that's out there and there are more changes coming that will continue to go up. Um, and so we've requ requested a couple of new positions to help with that review uh, to keep these critical projects on track. Uh, the other category in terms of the variable compensation plan is, uh, is the in-range adjustments. We looked for, for specific positions at our department where the, the proposed increase in the plan uh, does not adequately address uh, the person's uh, skills or authority or uh, value to us. Uh, it's a very modest request, and for both the, the new positions and the in-range adjustments, we've included a spreadsheet and a detailed justification for each position. Um, so I would ask for your consideration uh, on those. And again, I thank you for, for your support for the variable compensation plan. A uh, small request for uh, $2,500 for the portrait of uh, Governor Phil Bryant to hang in this building in the Hall of Governors. It's customary for the legislature to provide uh, that amount uh, for a, a governor's portrait and then the governor raises the rest of the money. Governor and First Lady have also committed to raising the funds for a portrait of the First Lady to hang at the old Capitol in the Hall of First Ladies. We're requesting a, an increase in spending authority of two and a half million. That will cover the uh, money that in previous years and in this upcoming year, <clears throat> the, uh, our board of trustees has directed to the restoration of Windsor Ruins and Historic Jefferson College from the Community Heritage Preservation Grant Program that y'all fund with bond funds. By agreement with the legislature, uh, we are, are um, working on those two projects through money from that source, but we need an increase in spending authority uh, to allow us to spend that, that money. And then finally, um, I will just say a, a brief word about our request for one-time funds. Um, you know, you've probably all heard me talk about this before. We are engaged with a number of partners in a major Southwest Mississippi initiative. Uh, 
The idea is to, um, is to elevate the historic and cultural attractions in that region and to uh, boost the visitation and the tourism income in Southwest Mississippi. When we came to you for the funds to open the two Mississippi museums, we promised that we would bring people in from out of state, give them an overview of our state's history and then send them out to the places where history happened. And we have done that. And we wanna take the next step, which is to strengthen <coughs> sites under archives and history. Our first priority was Windsor Ruins through the, uh, the preservation grant program that the legislature funds with bond money. We've completed the funding for Windsor Ruins and the work is about to begin. Our second priority was Grand Village of the Historic Indians, which is a national historic landmark site in Natchez that uh, we've had since the 1970s. It's a very important site and it has had very strong visitation and strong programming. We have the exhibits are the ones we originally installed in the 1970s. The museum is too small uh, to accommodate the crowds that come there. We wanna build a new museum, an outdoor pavilion and all new exhibits. Uh, our request for Grand Village is $6 million. And finally, Historic Jefferson College. I'm sure you all know it. It is the birthplace of statehood. It is right on the outskirts of Natchez. It is a beautiful site with a collection of eight historic buildings. Um, I know Senator Butler, you know it well, as well as Windsor and uh, Grand Village. Um, badly in need of restoration. It's one of the most significant sites in the state. And uh, our, our vision there is to establish a museum in two of the historic buildings. Uh, that takes a broad view of the history of that region um, with a focus on the, the cotton economy and slavery, the Native American experience, some of these stories that are central to the American experience and can be told in Natchez better than anywhere else. Uh, our other vision for that site is that we are working in partnership with Mississippi State University to establish a preservation trade school there. Uh, where we would partner with not only Mississippi State, but Tulane and, and other schools to bring students there to get hands-on training in preservation skills, repointing brick, restoring windows, so, so forth, highly marketable skills. They can get a college degree, they can have hands-on training, and they can do some of the work that needs to be done on those buildings and elsewhere in Natchez. Uh, for, the, for Grand Village of the Natchez Indians, and for the Preservation Trade School, we are requesting federal funding for Grand Village in partnership with the Muscogee Nation, which has close connections to that site. Uh, and for the trade school in partnership with Mississippi State University. For all of these projects, we are seeking other funding. Uh, it spends, spends a lot of time on it. We raise money at the Department of Archives and History from foundations in Mississippi, outside Mississippi, from private donors, uh, we look to the federal government grant programs. Uh, for every project we undertake, we find money from every source that we can. We do not simply look to the uh, state legislature. Um, if you think about the, the connections between these projects, the two Mississippi museums here in Jackson, Vicksburg, where the friends of the Vicksburg Military Park are hoping to build a new uh, visitor center um, that will increase the already strong visitation there and send people out around the region to understand the whole Vicksburg campaign. What the National Park Service is doing in Natchez at the Forks of the Road site, and then what we're planning at Grand Village and Jefferson College, you really start to see that, that this region of Mississippi can be a, a center for the education in American history. You really can't understand American history without understanding Mississippi history, and you can't understand Mississippi history without experiencing it in person. And we see the impact of the two museums on the school children who come in there. The experience of seeing those museums and learning about their history lifts them up. And we think we can do the same thing, not only for our children, but for new visitors to the state from around the country and around the world uh, in the Natchez region with your help and support. And that's all I have. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Okay. Any questions from the panel? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Ms. Blunt, for coming. Uh, you've referenced the two museums a lot today. I, 
ballpark. Just yeah. how many visitors a year y'all see and come to the museums? Well, they've been some strange years, but well, I understand. Um, <laughs> but overall, we've had we've had nearly half a million uh, visitors. Um, the of course the the first year was just gangbusters, well over our projections, and the next year was very strong. The third year was COVID. Fourth year was COVID. We had a big summer last summer. Uh, we we had a lot of school groups that were having summer programs come back, tour groups, then another dip in the fall. But but we are booked up with school groups now um, into the rest of the school year. I should also mention that um, that we're raising private money to underwrite field trips for any schools that that can't afford them. So we reach out to schools and we tell we tell them we will meet your need. You want to send kids here, tell us you need buses, you need lunches. Um, and we're going to complete that endowment in this calendar year. Uh, and so that we'll provide money year after year after year on into the future uh, to ensure that we have strong visitation from school children. Thank you. I've been curious about that. <laughs> Any other questions? Senators? Um, you mentioned. 2,500 for the portrait of former governor. Yes. Um, ballpark, what does it cost to, to hang one of those on the wall? It really depends who you get to pay it. I mean, we, we've um, we've had portraits for our Hall of Fame or for our, um, yeah, our Hall of Fame that didn't cost much more than that. But, you know, the governor selects his own portrait artist. And um, I'm, I don't know, to be honest, I know he has selected an artist. Um, but I don't know what it costs, but I told him that I would make the customary request. I was just curious, I'm, you know. Um, you were talking about the winds of ruin, so you've secured the funds and you're ready to start. I have been there. Um, so you're talking about shoring up the, um, the, the, the pylons that are leaning. Yes, all of the columns are in danger of falling. That's why there's a chain link fence around it. Tort claims told us, you know, you've got pieces falling on the public. You can't, you know, so if there's an ugly. I couldn't get close. I got up just right up to the fence. But uh, Well, I appreciate you not uh, tearing a hole in the fence like some people have. Um, I, I did see a couple holes, but no, yeah. I didn't go in. But, yeah. but I could see some of the columns. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they were never meant to be freestanding and they were never meant to be exposed to the elements. And uh, this is a project we've been working on for years. It's, it's such an unusual project. It took the conservation expert that we hired a while to figure out the solution. So in the museums or, or some, do you have a, a, what was a sketch of, of the, the home? Yes, we have a sketch. I, I saw that for the first time. Um, the main road coming in, there's a place, uh, buffet lunch, Senator Butler, help me. The name of the place we eat there on the main road, Old Country Store. Best country, best uh, fried chicken in the world. Right. Anyway, I, there, there is a, a, a drawing. Yeah. That's it. it. Okay. That's the only one that exists. There is a painting, but it's um, creative license was taken. Right, right. And I, I, that's what I was wondering of when I saw that. It Because uh, I'd always, you know, growing up and just in the history books, all you saw was the columns. And I was curious as to what the home actually looked like. So. Right. And it won't, the, it won't look different when the, when the stabiliz stabilization is complete. We're not... We're not putting things there that aren't there, just keeping it from falling down. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all very much. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. You running off? You running off? No. Arts and Commission. Well, we got Arts and Commission, but I don't see anyone. Um, we'll give them. A they're not actually due to 314. We better give them a minute. Here we go. Here we go. Arts and Commission? Yes, come forward. <laughs> we wouldn't do you that.
catch them. They got oh, they got the right one. Okay. Is it? You ready? Is it Sarah? Yes, I'm Sarah Story. I'm the executive director for the Mississippi Arts Commission. Welcome this afternoon. Thank you all for coming. You may begin. Thank you. Appreciate the time and the attention that you guys are giving to the arts today. So we have been around for many, many years. We are the statewide arts agency for Mississippi. So our primary purpose is to serve over 3 million people through grants, special initiatives that enhance communities, we assist arts, artists, and arts organizations, special projects, and we facilitate arts education and celebrate our cultural heritage all throughout the state. So I'll first talk a little bit about the overall impact of the Arts Commission. So on this annual report page, you'll see that we create almost 25,000 jobs a year. We have a $2.5 billion value add back to the economy. Every year we give out over 250 grants throughout the state, over $1.2 million, and that serves truly statewide. So we are able to touch 87 house districts and 49 Senate districts each year. So our grants vary widely. So we give grants to arts organizations. So your theaters, ballets, art museums, community groups throughout the state, we give grants to individual artists throughout the state. We also communicate the story of the arts in our state. So we all know how important our musical and cultural heritage is to the state. So we get to talk about that with our citizens within the state and with outside of the state through our governor's arts awards every year, through our Mississippi Writers Trail markers that exist throughout the state. We have a Mississippi Arts Hour radio show on public radio every week, every Sunday at 5 p.m. And we have an online journal that's dedicated to the folk life and arts in our state. So we also convene and offer professional development opportunities throughout the state for our sector each year. We also do a lot of arts education. Our primary program is our Mississippi Whole Schools program which exists in 26 schools throughout the state. And we serve about 14,000 students in arts integrated learning. We also uh, work hard to expand our resources each year. So we receive dollars from the state, of course, then federal funding through the National Endowment for the Arts, and then also through private funding through foundations and individual giving. So this next page is, it shows where we exist in the Senate districts. So as I mentioned, we give out more than $1.4 million a year. So although our budget's small, it just has a huge impact throughout the state in our sector. Um, so we gave grants out to 158 organizations this past year. We were able to give an additional 775,000 in American Rescue Plan. So we facilitate federal dollars when it comes through and that was to 83 arts organizations. And then we were also able to give 134 grants to individual artists throughout the state. So we funded 52 Senate districts in this past year. Yes. That, that was my question. Uh, see the blue and the white is uh, listed as a state. The, the blue is the ones that were funded. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you, yep, 52. So on the first page, you'll see our overall request, um, our August request that we submitted, and then our revised request since January. So in general funds, our request is $1,569,164 through the state special funds education enhancement of $490,000 um, through capital expense or special funds, $5 million for our whole schools program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then our building fund for the arts initiative, 12 million, and then non-state special funds, 1,097,000. So on the fifth page, you'll also see, sorry, sixth page, you'll see the impact of our Mississippi Whole Schools program. So you'll see state scoring, which we track every year. And each year, our whole schools program, our students score higher on state testing 
higher than their local districts and the state average every single year. So we've seen that this arts integrated learning really helps students with critical thinking skills and that shows in their math, science and reading test scores. So we are really passionate about the fact that the arts can help uh, our students in this way, especially through the past couple of years, as we all know, it's been particularly challenging around areas of learning loss with COVID and teachers, et cetera. So that's been really exciting to see those scores continue to uh, do well, even during the pandemic. Um, Larry, did you wanna talk about, or Steve, do you wanna talk about building fund or staff, staffing? Sure. Uh, I'm Steve Ed. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Arts Commission. Uh, Senator, good to see you again. Uh, the Building Fund for the Arts is an existing program that was funded with bond proceeds back uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, those proceeds uh, totaled about $19 million. They were funded originally with bond proceeds. We're asking you to consider funding them with capital expenses. We understand there is a good chance that the bond bill this year may be limited only to state projects. And uh, capital expenses appears to us to be a way to fund this program. It's obvious to us, uh, and I think to most, that COVID has taken uh, a huge bite out of the ability of particularly smaller arts organizations across the state to manage their capital facilities. Uh, it's easy for small art groups to raise money for programs. Not easy, but it's easier. They have an extreme problem, a very difficult problem, raising money for capital improvements. So this is a program that allows them to uh, access monies for those capital improvements. We did a survey uh, of 59 of our grantees it showed that they uh, had needs of about $8 million. So we feel like if we've been able to survey all of our grantees, the needs would be about $12 million. So that's, that's the request we have. Uh, in previously with the, the $19 million, we funded 150 projects in 47 counties. Our objective, if you were to fund the project this year, would be to first go to our smaller uh, arts entities in the state, who we feel like are the ones most in need, not to go to our larger institutions like those in the capital area, who do have needs, but we feel like they're more capable of raising funds for their capital expenditures than the smaller ones in the, the more rural or smaller community areas. Uh, again, COVID has caused uh, a lot of the need for this. Plus we haven't had this program now for uh, 15 years, I think. Uh, we have spoken to the Lieutenant Governor's staff about this. Uh, he's expressed uh, an interest in it because he actually, uh, has some projects that he would like uh, to see funded in a program like this, uh, where the money would not go necessarily to a city, but it could go to a 501c3 to make the improvements in, for example, a city owned building. So we're asking for the $12 million to fund, refund uh, the building fund for the arts I'll be happy to answer any questions. Hello, Senator. How are you? Okay, I think we're now ready. Hi, I'm Larry Morrissey. I'm the Deputy Director at the Arts Commission, and they wanted me to talk real quickly about our staffing request. Uh, we did, uh, we want to, first of all, just thank um, legislative budget, budget committee's um, support of the personnel board's move with SCC2. Um, given those changes, we'd, we'd like to make some 
some ad additional adjustments in order to um, put things in, uh, kind of round things out for, for the entire staff. Uh, one item in, in the budget request was we have an empty, a vacant pin that has been um, slated for, to be cut in the, in the request. We'd like to reestablish that pin and then uh, give it a title change and move it up to a programmatic level position that could handle stuff like the building fund for the arts that uh, Steve just discussed. And then the remaining amount of that uh, request is for doing some equity adjustments for four different staff people uh, related to the SEC2 uh, upgrades of, of salaries. And uh, so that's just at a very summary level, our, our situation with that. So you, you, you look, you have one vacant pen that you would like to re reinstate and yes, sir. reclassify. Yeah, reclassify up to programmatic level, right. Okay. Susan, you have anything else? Yes. Yeah, someone else. Well, we're, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. And no? yes. thank you. Senator. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. You mentioned a moment ago that test scores were improved because of the exposure. Do you, what is that difference? Is that a measurable difference y'all were able to tell us? Yes, absolutely. On page. Six, it's a uh, fiscal 19 chart ah, there it is. and it shows the between proficiency scores for math reading and science and then it shows um, district the our Mississippi whole schools and then the state average so for example on uh, percentages in math at the bottom right state average would be 35.1 percent Mississippi whole schools 37.65 and similar districts that Mississippi whole schools are in would be 33.4. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sarah, thank you. Um, um, Steve, I appreciate it. I'm, I got in late and I apologize if you've already explained this, but I see based on your request that we've got actually a reduction in salaries slightly on from what LBR was in your request, but a pretty significant increase in contractual uh, and then also the subsidies. Just explain to me the increase in contractual and the subsidies, if you would. Yes, Larry, do you want to explain the contractual increase? So, increase. The increase in contractual, I see your contractual request is up almost 200,000, about 100 and, um, 85,000, 86,000, and then, and then the subsidies are up about um, over LBR. And, and I don't remember why your LBR request was down on subsidies from the prior year, but can you address those two points? In terms of the subsidy dip, that's uh, reflecting, we have uh, American Rescue Plan money that we, we had $783,000. So our, our year to year grants were jumping significantly this fiscal year. For that one, for those one-time grants, and then the the jump in contractual would be reflecting our requests related to this arts and tourism initiative. That's part of the the increase in the, uh, the in in the general funds. Okay. Did you did Steve ex explain that in his? I'm sorry, I walked in late, Steve, but had another meeting. But did you explain the request for that um, arts and schools and arts program for, around the state? Yes, the Mississippi Whole Schools program. Yes, was yes. there anything else included in the contractual? The, the you know that's about one hundred and thirty-five thousand over last year, and like I said, almost a little shy of two hundred thousand on LBR. Correct. So for the Mississippi Whole Schools program, we are looking to expand that program this year, which would mean contracting more um, teaching artists and trainers throughout the state in order to help train more teachers in the schools statewide. Okay. okay, all right, thank you very much. We, we, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, uh, we've also been contacted by the Department of Education because they are true believers in this program that they would like us to go into those failing schools that they have identified 
uh, and see what we can do to improve those schools because they believe this program is something that might work in those schools. But what we'd like to do, because this program is so unique and so successful, is that we wanna take it statewide. And we've been urged to do that by many people, both in the education side and, and by others. Uh, one thing I don't think we mentioned was, maybe, we, maybe Sarah did, in 2001, our budget was $800,000 more than it is today, uh, which I find very interesting. Uh, and obviously over that time, there've been 5% cuts here and there, which accounts for part of it. But we've taken some dramatic cuts and there is no state agency that has a budget our size that does as much as we do for as little money and is as good as stewards of your money as we are. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you all so much for coming today. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Good to see you again. Briggs, you got one second. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to rise. Rise in the court. Thank you.